So how did you first decide to get into politics? Oh, um, <laughs> I got tricked into it um, as a uh, mother and as a medical doctor. I got very involved with communities that were fighting uh, pollution that's hurting the community, so in mainly fighting environmental racism in the form of coal plants and incinerators and toxic waste sites. And after doing that for a few years, um, I became part of a movement to uh, change the funding of politics, sort of go to the heart of the problem, the money corrupting the political system. And in my home state of Massachusetts, we passed a referendum overwhelmingly to uh, clean up money in politics through public financing so that uh, candidates could actually run for office without having to sell their souls. And of course, once we passed that, our legislature repealed it on a voice vote, a Democratic legislature. And around when that was happening, and uh, I, like so many other people, were feeling really hopeless about how are we going to fight this system if we can't, you know, if we can't green our energy system and provide jobs and um, get the money out of politics, you know, how are we going to get out of here alive? Around that time, uh, the Greens came to me and said, well, why don't you just keep doing what you're doing but call it a political campaign? and run for governor and be able to talk to more people about it. So out of desperation, you know, figuring everything else has failed, why not try politics? I said, sure, why not? And entered the campaign out of desperation and came out of it with a whole lot of inspiration to see how hungry people are, even inside of a political uh, vehicle. Even in an, in an election, people were just really screaming for other alternatives. And to me, that was incredibly exciting to see that there is um, a revolt waiting to happen. And this was back in the year 2002. So before you <coughs> um, joined with the Greens, mm -hmm. um, did you um, start out identifying with with the Democrats, or what was your initial? I was uh, one of those many people who was so um, off-put by our political system and its corruption. I was not uh, interested by any means in being a part of the Democratic or Republican Party, mm -hmm. so I really wasn't with any of them. I tended to vote Democratic, but, you know, was not, you know, really did not have enough interest or faith to do anything in that system. Uh, the first time I ever got involved, I was like 50 years old, and I went to a Nader rally because he was like saying real stuff. I thought it was really exciting. And what I saw going on at this Nader rally was a kind of community celebration that I hadn't seen since the 1960s. It was like an incredible flashback in the year 2000 to see um, uh, black people, white people, Latinos, young people, and old people, all in the same room, really excited about uh, a community that could work for all of us. When Al Gore, um, in 2000, for whatever reason, lost Florida by only a few votes, or won it, but was still on, which however we analyze it. Um, he was a, a much more progressive guy than George Bush, right? Do you think he would have invaded Iraq? Actually, he said that he would have, in his own comments. Uh, when Bush <laughs> invaded Iraq, uh, Al Gore actually said that he approved of that policy. I, 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 you may be right. I, I, I will. I, I, I have no independent knowledge on that. I, yeah. I, I'm yep. guessing he would have gone into Afghanistan because everybody would have gone into Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, I'd be surprised if Al Gore would have gone into Iraq. Al Gore 
didn't have his father as the justification for going into Iraq, which is, you know, that's why Junior went into Iraq, really. It was because to avenge his death. I don't know, actually. And there was certainly a lot of, um, yeah, yeah, good question. I, I, I don't know his. But let me say, I don't think that, what shall we say? As horrific as Republican policies are, I don't think that a um, slightly less lethal foreign policy is going to get us out of here alive. And if you compare uh, the record of Barack Obama in expanding our wars and surging into Afghanistan and um, spreading the drone wars and deciding on Tuesdays who's going to live and die, uh, I don't think that is a foreign policy we're going to live with. I think that a trillion dollars invested into nuclear weapons uh, from, thank you very much, Barack Obama, is going to get us out of here alive either. You know, I think you can um, compare individual policies or at least um, uh, the public relations surrounding them and say that the Democrats had a kinder, gentler policy, but behind the kinder, gentler verbiage, look where we've gone, you know? And what Donald Trump is doing is horrific on every score. Take uh, the war on immigrants. Where did that start? You know, that started with the Clinton policies that militarized the border and began to uh, criminalize uh, undocumented immigrants. You can look at, um, you know, the uh, mass incarceration and thank the Clintons as well for their omnibus crime bill of the 1990s. Um, you can look at Obama's deportations, which uh, equal those of Trump, and many say actually exceeded uh, what Trump has done. So, <clears throat> you know, you, you, you may be able to establish that in certain instances a Democratic policy would not be as lethal as a Republican, but look where we're going under both of them. And Democrats and Republicans have traded leadership over the decades while we have taken a nosedive on the environment. You know, where did um, the, uh, the bailout for the banks come from? You know, that was Barack Obama, who had the public enormously mobilized to hold the banks accountable. They were getting phone calls, like at a rate of 90 something to, you know, to, to 10 or 99 to one, something like that. The public was overwhelmingly furious at the banking industry. <clears throat> Even before Obama took office, you know, his first move was to actually appoint Larry Summers, the architect of the Wall Street meltdown, to come in and, um, uh, you know, and design the, the, the bailout, basically, for Wall Street. You know, or, or even the repeal of the Glass-Steagall and the setup for the Wall Street uh, waste, fraud, and abuse. You know, we can thank the Democrats for that uh, every bit as much and in some ways more than the Republicans. So I don't buy this uh, lesser evil stuff. And I think uh, we will go to our graves here splitting hairs uh, for, you know, waiting for Democrats to save us. Democrats are not coming to save us. And, you know, you can look at what they're doing right now on you know, uh, Obamacare that, and, and the incredible vacuum in our health care right now, are they standing up for single payer? No, they're not. They'll let Bernie Sanders dangle a carrot, an, an, an absolutely unachievable carrot in front of us right now and say, oh, look, there's one good Democrat out there who wants to do this while Nancy Pelosi and Chuck Schumer, who are truly calling the shots in the party, don't want to have anything to do with it. If the Democrats wanted to pass single payer, they could do it right now in California. They could have done it months ago in California, but they took it off the table because it was well positioned um, to win. Um, I once worked for Gary Hart. You know who Gary Hart is? Yeah. Um, and he had a favorite saying. No, we got five minutes to get there. Which was um, I'm going to have an accident. The perfect is the enemy of the good. Slow down. You for that first? Oh, sure. 
And what does that mean to you? What it means to me is, <clears throat> you know, that's not my criteria. I'm not measuring um, degrees of perfection. I'm looking for survival, survival, which we don't have right now. It is rapidly slipping through our fingers. And if, um, you know, uh, if perfectionism is being uh, used here to mischaracterize the, um, the real motives of, uh, of a radical reform movement, you know, I'm not interested in that well, one a, bit. A, a, a motive wouldn't. A motive is a uh, a term of um, aspersion in this context. Motive wouldn't be the appropriate description. Well, whether you're saying it's motive or personality no, trait no, or need, whatever need, it is, need, all, all those are all, all those. I would are, say uh, perfectionism has no place here. The the issue here is survival. It's tactic. It's tactical, not a not a. a, a it's not. In any way, uh, if we a all it's a, you, you, the way you're using it is is a characterization, or in the terms that I'm using it, it's a tactical, strategic approach. Right, and so is strategic. You know, uh, plugging is it strategic to plug one hole in the dam when the dam is collapsing, and and so I think it's a question of perspective and it's a question of of uh, insight. And I think we are at a Hail Mary moment right now where we need big changes on the climate. We need big changes in our foreign policy. I think um, that uh, we need to abolish nuclear weapons right now. Mm -hmm. I think we need to um, massively uh, invest in peace and in demilitarization, in a Green New Deal. I think we need Healthcare as a human right. I think a healthcare system that, mm, say, covers your pharmaceuticals, but that's all it does, which is essentially what the Democrats at one point were talking about. Now that I'm not even talking about that, they're just talking about protecting the Affordable Care Act. The Affordable Care Act, protecting the Affordable Care Act is not going to protect our health because it's going down the tubes as, as complex, multi, layered healthcare systems are uh, destined to do, unfortunately. They become too expensive to, you know, they, they all become obsolete. If a group of people agree on the long-term objectives, um, but one group thinks that a tactical approach of getting the boat the most at any given moment um, is a more um, productive approach versus someone you know I, I think people need to be given choices and for people to be bludgeoned into two pigeonholes which are both uh, bought and paid for by corporate America that's not a choice there are many ways that votes are suppressed. Voters are suppressed through voter ID laws, through stripping of the voter rolls, uh, through the um, uh, exclusionary debates that prohibit people from hearing about their other choices, and through a voting system uh, that basically says you have to vote for, you have to pick the lesser evil. Mm -hmm. I think it's not okay for a democracy to have people go to the polls and decide who do I hate the least. That doesn't move us forward as a democracy. You know, I think we need a substantive change in our voting system so that you can actually rank your choices knowing if your first choice loses, your vote is automatically, to your, uh, automatically reassigned to your second choice. We need a voting system that enables our values to lead the way. One of the most um, powerful mechanisms that the GOP uses to control. That who the, uses? Sorry? The GOP uses. Oh, okay. To control this system is how they control apportionment every 10 years. Yes. Every 10 years, for some reason, 
they seem to turn out in off-year elections and vote for their local state representatives who draw up these districts and that becomes the playing field for the next decade in, the, in which they use to control how many representatives they get in a given state. You agree? It's another form of voter suppression. Denying people a meaningful vote. Yes. Absolutely. But, but the mechanism I'm, I'm describing, you agree, is the fundamental one. It's one of many. I think they're all fundamental. I think it's pretty fundamental to strip people oh, sure. of their, of their, all, all, all that's true, of but, their vote. But the most obvious one, I mean, they strip people of their votes, they declare them ineligible, they change their um, voting um, location without telling them. There's a lot of mechanisms that they use. No doubt, 5% of the votes are, are, are suppressed, obviously. I, I, I think that's clear. You know, I, I think it's really... Um, I'm, not, I'm not sure where you're going with that question. Uh, let, let me, let, I'll explain why I'm asking. Okay. It's, it's important because the reason why they control the system is because of these off-year elections. They are able to get their people to vote in way, either by manipulating them well, on... Well, you know, and another reason is that we don't have uh, parties and candidates that, that warrant people coming out to the polls. And as we've had two political parties that have marched to the right, disenfranchised communities don't come out to vote. And particularly in off-year elections, people do not feel empowered by the Democratic and Republican political establishments. So it's a complex idea. I just think... You know, the, the real take-home lesson here is that uh, if you want to fix the system, it's not by silencing political opposition. And it's not by scolding people who uh, are too principled or by uh, casting aspersions on people as spoilers for daring to stand up for what we need. And I'm not saying that's where you're going. You know, yeah, you're being a journalist here and, and journalists take all kinds of positions for the sake of discussion. So that's not like saying you, the uh, person at the other end of the camera. I mean, people out there, because this is a common point of view, particularly uh, in the establishment media, that uh, you're, we're bad little boys and girls if we actually stand up for what we truly need, as opposed to what we think this, this predatory system will give us. You know, we're supposed to have this very um, calculated approach where we got to double think, you know, and we got to roll the dice instead of going for where our values are that tell us we should have a society, you know, that is just, that is equal, where we have health care and education as human rights, where a generation is not destined to lifelong debt, where, um, you know, where we have affordable housing, where we have a livable environment. These shouldn't be calculations. These should be things we can just stand up for without being punished at the polls. So I would say rather than casting aspersions on, uh, on, on, on the resistance, on political resistance, both voters and parties and candidates, we should cast aspersions on the political system that tries to bludgeon us into laying down our resistance and surrendering to two political parties that are throwing us over the cliff. One more quickly, perhaps, than the other, but we're going over the cliff with both of them. I would say funnel that energy into political reform and into getting a ranked choice voting system in your state or proportional representation or getting open debates because cracking through any one of those um, those strangleholds on our democracy then opens the floodgates to you know to fixing all the critical problems and I think it's absolutely unacceptable to um, uh, to vilify people who dare to stand up for what we need that's again a characterization. I didn't That's offer. what? It's a characterization which I didn't offer. Okay. Well, as I say, I'm not talking about you. I'm okay. talking about a prominent viewpoint that's out there that needs to be answered. Okay, that's fine. Now, I, I have no problem with you answering it, but I just want to make sure you're describing it to me. Yeah, I have no idea where you stand politically. I don't know. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Okay, so this, there's the second mechanism that is the most powerful thing that is affects power in America. Well, in your in, view. In, in my view. So you, in uh, your uh, view, uh, gerrymandering uh, uh, is number one. Yes. I'd say it's up there. Definitely. But, you know, I, I, I just want to be clear. I'm, I don't have a rank order exactly of that okay. sort. I, I, will, I will pose the second one. Okay. Which is, in my mind, obvious, which is the Supreme Court, which is something where when you have a majority who are 45 years old or whatever the age will be potentially after Trump is impeached, um, whoever he, he appoints next, which whoever it will be, will be there for 45 yeah. years. Yeah. Um, yeah. The impact of that is, is so extraordinary. It is. It's extraordinary and it's horrible. Mm -hmm. So is war. Mm -hmm. um, and as much as I love a good Supreme Court, uh, I don't think we should sacrifice everything for the Supreme Court alone. It's not the only issue out there. And I would say that um, in the era of Richard Nixon, where we had, you know, one of the most conservative and corrupt presidents ever, at least before now, um, you know, we got women's right to choose out of that very conservative Supreme Court because we were out there. Uh, we've gotten a number of court decisions just recently uh, around the, um, the travel bans, for example, because we turned out in huge force. So, you know, at the end of the day, I think we have to be the drivers here of our agenda, not a corrupt political system that we surrender to. And with that, I'm going to run and I would say keep fighting. So generous of you to give me your time. Glad Appreciate to do it. Much. Thank you. Keep up all great, your, great your good fun, Great time talking to you. Like I, I hope I wasn't too difficult. <laughs> I just hope you keep your eyes open and don't get too buried in the uh, the machines. Are you a fan of Michael Moore, by the way? Well, do you know what Michael Moore just said about the Democratic Party? I did not hear what he recently said about the Democratic Party. What he recently said about the Democratic Party is a party with um, no plan, no leaders, and no vision for the future. Mm -hmm. And I kind of agree with him about that. Mm -hmm. And I don't think, um, I don't think that uh, slow strangulation is better than a gunshot wound to the head. I think we deserve an America and a world that works for all of us, and we should not be in the business of talking each other into surrendering. Courage is contagious. That's Use a, it. That's a good closing line. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thanks much. Likewise.